What can financial literacy do for your practice and your career? We're here to talk about how you can become more knowledgeable as a physician with business intelligence that can really skyrocket your results. My name is Dr. Elsie Coe. I'm the CEO and founder of Lead Physician Leadership Program for Physicians. We're starting soon, so listen to the end to hear more about that. I'm also, uh, we're also going to be talking about these, every, these very specific skills essential skills that every successful physician should have. I'm the CMO of American Endovascular and Amputation Prevention. Go to our YouTube channel and subscribe so you can be notified every time there's a video that comes on. Lead Physicians all about bringing passion, purpose, and potential back to our physician. So without further ado, let me just introduce you to Dr. David Norris. Hello, how are hey, David, you? Thank you so much for being here. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, so, so David is a practicing anesthesiologist in Wichita, Kansas. He's also the assistant clinical professor of the University of Kansas School of Medicine. He's the author of these books that I got. I don't know anyone who's written a book like this, a physician, the financially intelligent physician, uh, what they didn't teach you in medical school and really giving you the business intelligence to apply to your practice and organization. He's also a negotiations con uh, consultant. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, David, tell us a little bit about your book. How did you get into writing this? Oh, well, the book came out um, as a, uh, a product of, of something I was working on in my MBA class. Um, one of my classes was data analytics, and you had to choose a project. So I decided to see what sort of problems physicians were facing. So I uh, snail mailed about a thousand copies of a one-time uh, survey to physicians in my area. Uh, I got about a 40% response rate for just a one-time mailing. Wow. Uh, and that, it, it, yeah, it was pretty impressive. I was surprised. <laughs> and in that survey, I asked a bunch of different questions. The first questions, the set of questions were revolved around personal finance. Do you know how much you have in checking? Do you balance your checkbook? Um, do you know how much you spend on and do you manage a budget? And the other questions uh, on the other side of the survey were about business acumen. Do you know how much you make per patient? Do you know what you spend per patient? Do you know what your income statement says? Do you know what your balance sheet says? Do you know, really understand how to read those? Do you, what other areas do you feel uncomfortable with? And out of that, um, I found that uh, if, if you don't manage your personal finances, you probably don't know what's going on in your business finances. There is a strong correlation in the data set. So if you knew what was going on in your business, you probably knew what was going on in your private life as well. Um, the other thing was that financial intelligence was number one. Most of the, uh, the the number one response that they felt they need had a deficit was reading income statements and balance sheets and understanding the financial health of a practice. Um, you know, they may watch, you know, um, MSNBC or Bloomberg or, or Fox Business, and they hear them talking about all these terms. But they not, may not necessarily understand how to use those uh, terms in their own personal or their business. The other one was negotiating uh, was number two, um, process improvement and, you know, making things run efficiently was number three. Um, and then uh, marketing and other things. At the bottom of the list, oddly enough, was leadership. Every physician thought they were a really good leader. And um, <laughs> I'm here to tell you that's that's not true uh, from based on what I've seen my colleagues do. So that I, I, I just looked at that list and said, well, number one, the number one need right now seems to be financial intelligence. So. I uh, kind of went through and uh, began to carve out what I've taken away from my MBA classes and put that into a, a book. Uh, really, you know, as a resource for the uh, physician who's running their own show or they sit on a board and they want to make certain they really understand that the data the accountants are giving is right. And then they know how to use that data to make the best decision possible for the practice, their employees and their patients. Yeah, what, uh, I think so. what's I, I I've been reading your book, and what I notice is that you put in a lot of stories, um, at you know from the vantage point of a physician. So it's not just like any financial book that you could buy in Barnes and Noble or Amazon. Yeah, I I, I tried to make it uh, relatable uh, so that uh, those examples you could actually see how it might impact your own uh, your own business. Um, and yeah. I, I think it's incredibly important that physicians 
know how to read those financial reports. I mean, right. it's no so different than, you know, we know how to read EKGs, chest films. Uh, we know how to interpret lab. Well, that's what the EKG, uh, that's what the uh, financial reports do. They tell us the same financial health information that we just need to learn how to use that. When we had to learn it when we went through med school, but now we just got to learn a different skill set. And it's not that hard to do. That's right. So uh, tell us kind of uh, the topics that are in there. I, reading financial reports, understanding yeah. income. Mm -hmm. Sure. So in, in the book, I talk about how to read an income statement, um, what things you need to look for in an income statement. Don't always focus on the top line and also don't focus on the bottom line. Um, you know, you need to look at the stuff in between. You need to look at what your charges are, your write offs. You need to know what your costs are. Need to know what your variable and your uh, fixed costs are. And I talk about those in the books. I talk about why some things appear on a balance sheet and other things appear on the income statement. And then how, uh, and towards the end of the book, I talk about how the balance sheet and the income statement interact and relate to each other. Um, the banker, they always want to know what your balance sheet is. Uh, they're going to want to know your income statement as well. But the balance sheet can tell you your assets and your liabilities. From that, you're going to determine how healthy you are. I mean, if you get in a cash crunch, are you going to be in trouble? Are you going to be able to survive, make payroll, um, things like that. Um, those sort of questions and that sort of planning really require you to understand what's on your financial reports. And then finally, um, the, the cash flow statement, I think is probably one of the most important statements. And now it's not one that's typically handed out. You can either make it yourself. I teach you how to do it or you ask your accountant to get it to you, but it's going to tell you exactly where cash is going to and coming from. And uh, it's hard to hide things on a, on a cash flow statement and you'll see exactly what's going on and you'll see the impact of the decisions you're making in terms of how you invest the assets of the company and whether or not they're generating a positive cash flow that will help you prolong your business into the next years. Awesome. Do you think this book applies to physicians? 60% of physicians they say are employed. Um, I know I could see how this really helps people build their own private practice. I could see being applicable to even employed physicians. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, you, the information is important um, as an employed physician. And, and I've been both a shareholder of a, of a private group as well as, as an employed physician. And mm -hmm. having that skill set and being able to have that discussion with those in the larger organizations that you may serve under um, gives you, I wouldn't say, well, it gives you leverage and gives you accessibility in terms of into their decision making when you can read that income statement or that balance sheet and say, now this, this, your plan isn't going to work because of X, Y, Z, or I'm beginning to see this trend this way. Our costs are going up or our payer mix is changing. We need to address that sooner rather than later. Those sort of things as an employed physician will help you um, uh, become more invaluable and, That's and right. to your employer. But uh, ultimately, you know, the book and the goal was to help physicians who want to go into private practice to go in there and those who want to stay, give them the tools they need to be able to stay. Awesome. Thank you so much. And, you know, you, we, you, you spoke earlier about how uh, the, the bottom of the totem pole was um, leadership. <laughs> I thought that was very interesting. And yet you teach leadership through your uh, financial um, acumen and, and, Basically, I want to go through some of the maybe top things. You wrote an article. You wrote a lot of blogs. And one of the articles that you wrote are, you know, top 10 things that everybody needs to, to know when it comes to, especially residents, you said, but most es essential skills that every successful physician should have. Mm -hmm. And, you know, really being a great leader is understanding the financial stuff. But can you just talk about maybe some of the top five things? Sure. Oh, so number one, I think, is understanding the financial reports. You need to you need to understand the income statement, balance sheets, cash flow statement, and you need to understand how you make those decisions, how they're going to impact that. You need to understand the financial health and integrity of the organization that you're in charge of or that you're uh, responsible for, um, because you, know, you, you have a responsibility to yourself, to your patients and to those that you employ. Um, the, the second one, I think, is you got to know your processes. 
Uh, and that would be what I mean by that is you got to know what your patient is going to experience when they uh, experience the care that you provide. You know, patient satisfaction is one part getting the diagnosis right, you know, making certain that they get better or that or you're managing the disease. That's just one part of it. I think it's probably a gazillion parts, their perception of the quality of the care that you provide. Okay. So you know, having elderly parents who go have gone through the, the healthcare system, and I listen to what they talk about. Now, they my dad loves his oncologist. Um, but at when he first started going there, you know, he's like, these guys, they can't get the bill right. Am I getting good care? I mean, does he does a doctor know what he's doing because they can't get the bill right? And we've called the office four times and we're still dealing with this issue. Now, my very well be a very good oncologist. And I think he is, but that whole process and the whole patient experience um, needs to be addressed by you, the leader, uh, you know, you need to figure out, you know, what are, do you, as a physician, do you ever walk in through the front door of your office or do you always come in through the back? We usually come in through the back and we never walk through the front door and see what is it the patient's going to feel, experience, what are they going to sense? What are they going to feel? And I think if we begin to know our processes, we can tweak them so that we are better able to help our patients understand what it is we're trying to do for them and reinforce those emotional feelings that we want our patients to have. Um, and that's I talk quite a bit about that in my uh, courses uh, and as well as my second book, uh, uh, Great Care Every Patient. Yes, because awesome. It's really patient satisfaction really is, is uh, hangs on their perception of our care, quality of care. And we right. can, and, we can, and even, we can impact that. Yeah. And even if you work in the hospital, if you understand process improvement, boy, you, with your clinical skills and that, and if you want to get into leadership, that will definitely make you stand out from the rest. Yep. Yep. And, um, you know, it's fun because, you know, I, I've gone to a couple of different hospitals with my dad and uh, my mother, and I can tell you, which hospitals have it down and which ones don't and which yes. offices do and don't. And um, I, they, they approach it differently. It's not just about, you know, the making the right diagnosis. They see the bigger picture. So that would be number two is really understanding that. The, the, yeah. the third thing I would say that as a leader you need to do is you need to be comfortable with letting your people flourish. You know, people, are the most important thing in healthcare because we're a service industry and it requires people to do the care. People actually have to start the IVs, give the drugs, take the vitals, perform the surgeries, make the diagnoses. It's the people that actually deliver what, we, what we're doing. And we need really good people. Now, sometimes we don't necessarily trust our people to help us make things better. And what, what, what I really recommend is that you know, if you have an I, you have someone who comes to you with an idea for making this process better, making it better for the patient or you or even themselves, there's pro, there's there's a reason why they're doing that, and and I hope that you're humble enough as a leader that you're able to to listen to that good idea, and incorporate it and then act upon it if it does in fact support and move your whole organization closer towards your mission and purpose. So, you know, if, if you foster a culture as a leader, as you know, every I'll listen to any idea, it uh, doesn't matter who it comes from. And if it's a good one, we will act on it and we'll give credit appropriately. You're going to have people who are more engaged and they want to make right. the organization better. Yeah, um, more loyal to I, you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I haven't had that experience in, um, uh, when I was the president of my, my group was I had a physician. A lot of people didn't really think highly of he came to me with an idea and dang, it was a good idea. And, you know, if I had, if I had kind of listened to, you know, the chatter behind the scenes and kind of disregarded his idea, we would have missed out on a lot, a lot of money and a good opportunity. Whereas I listened to the idea with an open mind um, and said, if this idea came from anybody else, would I act on it? And the answer was yes. And I gave him credit for that. Um, Very so amazing. Amazing. Be 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 willing to, to let your people flourish and understand. Oh, this is the other thing. 
part of that people flourishing, the problem with, I think, a lot of corporatization of healthcare is that people show up on the income statement. We show mm -hmm. up as an expense, but right. really we need to be on the balance sheet. We need to be seen as the assets of the company because right. without us people doing the care, there is no business. There is no company. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so, but I think a lot of people, because of where we appear on balance sheets and the income statement, we don't appear on the balance sheet, but we show up as an expense and expenses have to be controlled. But I care, but you, we, we care for and we nurture assets. We don't, we don't see our homes and our cars as expenses. We probably see them as assets. We want to make sure we take care of those things, but we mm -hmm. need to take that mindset when we talk with our employees and the people that we go. Uh, that work for us. Right. Especially so. this day and age with the problems with the, uh, the staffing of a lot of hospitals and organizations and offices, yeah. finding the right people so hard. So you, everything you can do to retain them is, is yeah. crucial. Absolutely. Then I, I would say the fourth one is really, really study and learn how to negotiate. Um, you know, everything we get in life is something that we negotiate and every encounter really probably is a negotiation and it takes a lot of practice training uh, to get good at negotiations and to get comfortable with the negotiations. Um, and I, when I teach negotiations as, as a consultant, um, I teach what I learned from my old mentor, Jim Camp. Um, I met him uh, because I was having problems. Um, I read his books. I emailed him and said, hey, this is working for me. Thanks. Um, and then I uh, um, didn't ever expect to hear back from him. And we wound up having conversations um, about, you know, how to make it better. And eventually kind of took me under his wings and started doing workshops with him. And then I still work with the company, even though he passed away a while ago. Wow. But what he taught me was a, a systematic, methodical approach to negotiations that uh, has truly empowered me and those that I've coached and consulted with, they've really seen their games change fundamentally and how they negotiate and, and the results that they get. So spend some time, you know, and really focus on learning how to negotiate effectively um, and get in the right mindset. A lot of that comes from mindset and it comes from a growth mindset um, and um, uh, negotiating with a growth mindset rather than a fixed I think a lot of people negotiate from a fixed mindset and that's why they see the pie is small and they got to get their share. And that's why a lot of deals aren't as good as they could be. Right. Um, and a lot of uh, communication skills and built in there mm -hmm. thinking about the other person instead of your own. own yeah. Person. I think physicians, I, I think physicians are actually trained pretty well to be good negotiators. We just have to take some of those clinical physical diagnosis skills we learned in the first year of med school. And if yep. we take some of them and tweak them and apply them to a negotiation, um, it really, really does make a negotiation go a lot smoother and easier for, for you and, and your adversary or the uh, person on the other side. Excellent. And then the fifth thing I would say is be teachable. Um, one thing I've run across is that the guys that have problems and aren't teachable continue to have the problems no matter how much money they spend on consultants. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> the, one of the first things I actually do uh, in part of the intake with, if you, as a, if I'm going to work with you as a consultant is I got to get a feel for how coachable or, can, or teachable you are because, because if you're not really moldable or open-minded or you don't, you, you think you know it all, uh, and a lot of physicians do because we we tend to think we might be the smartest people in the room because, you know, we went to med school and everything. But <laughs> we, we, we don't know everything. And the fact right. that you the minute you realize you don't know everything and you now have an open mindset to learn and be teachable, um, you can really take your leadership. You can take your practice to the next level because, you know, um, that's really about personal improvement and self-improvement. Um, and making things better for you and your and your employees and your staff, your 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 patients, and and that's why I I put out those summaries 
weekly. Yep. Those book right. summaries I do, I give those out for free for people because I, I want to give them resources. And maybe that 12 minute summary gives them something because they realize, you know, I'm not as smart as I need to be. And then they hear that right. summary and then they go get that book and that book will take them up to the next level. And that's the whole right. the point of that is, I'm, you know, trying to help those who are teachable. That's become right. Better. What I, what I noticed also is uh, with my clients is that we, and you know, personally in my, my history is we know that we don't know everything and we get to a point where, you know, we are so used to being the one who's the smartest in the room and then, and then we're not, and then the insecurity sets in and then the whole self-image piece of not being confident, you still want to, you don't want anyone to know that you don't know. So <laughs> it's a lot of, it's a lot of mindset, like you said. Yeah. Um, and and um, vulnerability, being vulnerable to being willing to be vulnerable. Um, yeah, so I think you know, um, I think that being teachable and not being afraid to ask a question that makes you feel dumb. So there's a difference between you feeling dumb when you ask the question and then whether or not you actually look dumb. I think a lot of us think I'm going to I'm going to feel dumb because I'm going to ask this question. What is this thing on the item? What's this item on this? balance sheet or this income statement. I don't understand what this means. What what I've found is the doctors and the groups that have I've worked with that have had millions of dollars embezzled, they they admit I don't know how to read those and I felt stupid asking questions in front of everyone else like I don't know what this means. Right. And I think a part of that comes from being beaten over the head for so long as med students, right? If you didn't yeah. know the answer, you kept your trap shut. Well, <laughs> when you get out in the real world, if you don't know the answer, ask questions. I mean, okay. you, you got to flip the paradigm on its head. And I think yeah. some of us still, still get stuck in that, that old right. way we were taught, unfortunately, right. in, in medical school. Uh, and and yeah. And it's, it's ironic how people will see you, actually not what you think they they see you as they don't see you as dumb they they have more respect for you when you are vulnerable and mm -hmm. and saying hey can you can you show me how to do this so, yeah yeah so i think <laughs> it, 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 being coachable i think that's probably one of the most important ones having that that adult growth mindset that realizes i don't know everything somebody else out there does all i got to do is ask the right question and i can grow as an individual yes so, David, tell us how uh, somebody can reach you and um, what are your offerings? Um, they can go to my, I have a website, then go to it's www.davidnorrismdmba.com. Um, there, you know, they can either reach out to me via uh, one of the contact forms. Um, there they'll learn about my, you know, I, I do speaking engagements, I do uh, trainings. Um, uh, and as well as a personal consulting uh, with a group or an individual, they will find uh, how they can get uh, my books if they want them. Um, I, uh, I do provide those for people who ask, you got to ask. Um, and then uh, you can find, uh, you can find some of my free webinars. I have a couple of free hour webinars on there. They can check out financial intelligence, negotiations, process improvement, leadership and team building, uh, contract negotiations and burnout. Um, they can find, I also have some online courses that are available, uh, that they can enroll in if they would like. Um, and then they can also, uh, sign up if they, uh, want to work with me as a consultant. They can also shoot me an email at David, at David Norris, MD, MBA .com, Uh, and, um, uh, um, there are lots of ways to reach, reach me on the, on the website or they, uh, um, well, thank you so me. much for this. This is so good. And thank you so much for writing a book like that. I have not seen anyone write like books. It was such a pleasure to run into you and find your book and get your book just by asking, like you said. Uh, thank you everyone for watching. My name is Dr. LC Co. And if you have a topic on physician leadership, please reach out to me at info at drlcco.com. And if you're interested or you have a colleague who may be interested in getting leadership training, we're starting in mid-September. So reach out to us. Check us out at leadphysician.org. Any last words, uh, David, for people out there listening? Um, yeah, I would just say take a self, personal self-inventory of what you do and don't know, what you feel comfortable with. And if there's certain areas you feel uncomfortable with, guess what? Those are the areas you probably ought to work on. Yes. And uh, don't be afraid to tackle those. Um, I've never regretted taking the time and energy investing in myself and my own education and knowledge. 
Um, it takes time and energy, but it's probably the best investment you'll ever make. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.